Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Prasanna. I hope I want to check if I'm audible. If you hold it. No. Am I audible? Sorry. Uh, I hope that's better. Yes. Um, so the talk that we wanted to talk was, uh, I come from a background of penetration testing. Ketan comes from a background of QA. Uh, we wanted to talk about how we could mix both the worlds together. Uh, so before I jump in, let me just do a quick introduction that gives you a little bit of help. Uh, I right now work for a company called ThoughtWorks. Uh, we are a software development house. And my job role is penetration testing of applications that we build. I speak in a lot of security conferences and uh, I'm very proud of a certification called OSCP, one of the best in security domain. Uh, that's about me. I'll let Ketan take over. Hello friends, so I'm Ketan. Uh, so I'm associated with ThoughtWorks for the last five years. Uh, my typical role at ThoughtWorks is QA. So basically whatever falls under QA bucket, that's something that's what I do. So today we are just going to learn a little mix of both the words, security as well as the workplace. Okay, so basically the agenda for this session is like, uh, uh, we just wanted to see like what is the typical use of users and then we'll talk about something is and uh, how we can achieve automation in the field of information security, how we achieve the complete coverage for the entire cross functional testing that we do for our project. Uh, we'll take an example, we'll define the workflow, we'll try to assume that workflow and see certain demos as well. Uh, we'll see type of attacks that we use, maybe use CSS or XS, yeah, for example, XSS or whatever. I'm sorry for that. And use CSS and XPath, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, uh, so, so XSS or SQL injection, command injection, or proto buffer injection, or th things like that. And then we'll just come to a conclusion. So, yeah. So, then when I say functional, is it's mostly uh, we just try to see whether things, like for example, whenever we test certain things, we just make sure that whether it is meeting the requirements as expected or not. So that's, that's typically what we do as a tester. But uh, when we actually try to do an automation, we generally use, like as Anand mentioned in one of his uh, uh, presentation, that we generally take care of, of all the layers that we have defined in the test pyramid and think about you know, how we can you know, <coughs> form our test or organize our test in different layers. But one of, so one of the layers uh, is, is, is UI automation. And whenever we talk about UI automation, I think Selenium is, is one of the most widely used tool that we generally use for, for that. So yes, we did a lot of automation for UI, uh, which is a, like a web applications. Uh, we always use it for cross-browser testing. We use it for other purposes as well. But uh, we always, uh, we, we, we used to wonder as in like, yes, we need to give certain value addition to our client. And how can we leverage our Selenium's ability to do certain things apart other than what uh, we generally do for functional testing. So, so, so my question would uh, be for you guys, like, have you guys tried anything apart from functional testing or, or UI automation uh, using Selenium? Have you, have you tried anything else? Okay. Nice. I'm not wrong, profiling or JavaScript, like whether the thing is performing quite uh, fast or not. So that's something what you've tried for, which is a good thing. So you can achieve like various things uh, using Selenium apart from your UI automation. But uh, what we thought is in like whenever, so I used to work as a functional tester, but uh, I came in contact with uh, Prasanna, who is like a big fan of uh, security. And one day we were discussing something and we said like, how can we help each other? How can we, you know, uh, leverage Selenium's ability to do certain things? So that's where, uh, Prasanna came in. Okay, uh, now with the, that's my last line is my favorite job, why I do security though. One of the most interesting jobs on earth is security. It's basically to find faults into someone else's code and say, dude, this is wrong. I can totally take control of your system, 
just by doing these things. And I really enjoy doing that every day of my life. But there are some, ex some extremely major problems that happen. Some of the most important problems happens is, today, uh, some of the times I work a lot for banking clients, and their first rule is I need complete code coverage. Now the problem with security for me, that zone is, hey, do I concentrate on quantity of finding issues, or do I go behind finding some of the hidden gems? And hidden gems in for me is something that I would get total control of the system, where uh, maybe I could discuss an example where I could uh, take control of a system wherein I say, debit an account with certain amount of money, but credit someone with a lot of money. All these are things that you could do with uh, a security control problem. What do I need to do to spend my time more with actual problems and cut down some of the, uh, what I would say, known issues? So let's say WASP top 10. That's a guidelines that most of we as a web app testers follow. But that is just to say scraping the security side of it. We're just saying if you don't even follow OS top 10, you're not really doing anything in security. Then there are some basic problems. So what we really tended to do is, hey, can we take these automation frameworks? He loves Selenium. I'm not a very big lover of Selenium. I am still a
and it will automatically start hacking. That magic bullet is still not there. And yeah, this code is the shittiest code on earth. So we are not even going to talk about page object pattern and things like that, as Anand mentioned in the stand. But not this is just to show you the demo. <laughs> okay, moving on. Yes. So, so that is where I, what I do is I use, uh, so I would have shown you the right one. I use things like cookie jar and stuff like that. So what I do is, uh, so once you log in, uh, we, I will use the same cookie, store the cookie, and I will keep sending the requests out. So for the server, it thinks it's the same session making that request. It will not do multiple requests and stuff like that. In this case, it's not needed. But in that case, I would have stored a cookie jar made an actual login, taken that, stored it into a cookie jar, and henceforth all requests will, it will look like a normal browsing session there. You, you, like you said, that's a fact, actual problem, so you need to think through how you'll do it then. Because typical bank website does that actually. They won't allow you more than three logins or whatever, three attempts or something like that. So if, for everything, there is a beautiful library available. It's just that you have to find out which library works. Not just silly. <laughs> Okay, XSS. This is one of the most common. If you today look the attacks that are available on the web for web application hacking, XSS tops it. People think XSS, most of the people here, XSS means it's an alert pop-up box. Is that right? That's what everyone thinks. XSS is actually more dangerous. It's my favorite attack. It's the most dangerous. Easiest to find sometimes, and the toughest to find sometimes. Um, because what really happens with XSS is, it's not the alert pop-up box. If I could just part one point, if I could go away with is, XSS is not alert one. XSS basically means the capability to run JavaScript on a client machine. Basically meaning, any security control that you have implemented is gone as a developer that you've put, then basic it, uh, Java, XSS can then start doing what an individual user did. So that's the reason. So let me just show, just giving you a small, like what I did for SQL injection, let me show you how. So there is a, let's say there's a scenario here. There is an yellow box there showing, it's like a text box, wherein you can enter details, and you can hit submit. And this is something that you all have seen. You've seen that You've searched for something and it is telling that you searched for this. Cross-site scripting, the fundamental issue that you really need to take care is data when it travels from the client, goes to the server, comes back as is, you will have a cross-site scripting. Only caveat to this is DOM XSS. I'm not gonna discuss DOM XSS. DOM XSS is a little different subject though. But Effectively, it basically means that you can change anything in the response. Did, did that make sense? Just to give you an example, what if I enter something like that? This everyone knows, right? See, the, there is a, something that I wanted to show here. Hello, script, and there is something called the their friends. You see that the their friends did not come. The reason being is JavaScript, you have to click OK, then only that there will come there. That's the depth we wanted to show it to you. It is basically saying that you can run JavaScript on the client end user machine. What is the risks of having this? Most prominent, I can steal their cookie. Imagine this on a banking application. Uh, as an application, they should have turned on HTTP only in their cookie. That's first things that they should have done. If they didn't, so someone would ask, what is HTTP only then? Basically, it's a feature which tells that client JavaScript cannot access the cookie a browser control which does that. But let's say they did not put HTTP only. The script can basically used to steal an individual user's uh, cookie. Or you have a CSRF and you put a CSRF protection, you can bypass it. Today, if you find a cross-site scripting on Facebook, you can be richer by at least 6,000 US dollars. That's the money Facebook pays. Uh, do you know that some of these sites allow bug bounties and you can make money if you find security issues, right? A lot of money to make. A lot of Indian security guys only work on XSS. Write scripts, run it across applications, see if it gives responses. 
you can use some of these scripts to do that job. Okay, so uh, any specific queries on XSS? Am I clear before I get into a demo? That did uh, XSS make black? <coughs> Sorry. Now for XSS, I did something a little different. Where's my tester script? So, now with XSS, there are some very unique things that you need to consider. The general idea is data going from a client to a server and returning back is the only consideration that you needed to keep in mind probably three years back. Today you need to even consider things like where is this information coming back to? Is it back? So today when, when we talk about cross-site scripting, we say context could be five different contexts. I have used only two here. Is the data coming back in a script context? Is the data coming back in HTML context, CSS, uh, attributes? Things, these are things that are, because how you hack into each one of this is different the way the data comes in. So it's more important to know where it is going. So you need to write scripts even to get that information back to you. So I'll just take a quick second to discuss this one. So for this, I used another very interesting library. This library is called Mechanize. It's a beautiful library. It allows me to find forms in a page. Uh, so what I did was I wrote a generic one. This is a very simple one. It's a beautiful, try making it a little bigger. So what this automate has a function called getter. Basically it gets all the information of, you give it any page, it tells you what all uh, forms are there in that page and sends it back to that information back to you. So now you can see start tying it up. So I start from his, I get the links, I use this application, get the forms, then send it to XSS, get the information back. So when I am writing an application, I'm not going to put it in all small, small pieces like this. When I'm in my actual code, it's all combined together. But you may want to choose to keep it separate also. So the choice is yours. So the only thing that is a little different here is, so here SD represents the information that is coming back from that library. Now, this is going to be generic. I don't know the total number of forms that are going to come. So I put it in a loop and then did the job there. Okay. So let's try running this one. So if you notice here, I have not used any payload here. I am only looking for information sent, is it coming back to me to me? Because with cross-site scripting, I don't want to do automatic hacking. If information comes back, I have a list of things that I want to manually check every component. Because XSS could be really, really complex. You might want to close, uh, so some of the places where I have done XSS, we have closed five to diff six different tags in the front, then did a script attack, then closed the tags in the rest. So, you cannot think that can I automate this process. It becomes a little difficult. So, but what I can automate is every piece of information that came back to me, I want to see. That's the reason that script, the script works. So now what it is basically saying here is, this is vulnerable. It could be vulnerable to XSS. It say, now if you look at it, I have started with a script uh, array. I have created an HTML array. I also want to know which context this information is coming back to. So if you really look at it, it says H2. H2 is a uh, HTML context. So I basically could close it with normal H2 and then do a script. If it was going into an attribute, I could just say on load or uh, on body mouse over or something like that. So we need to know which context this information is going to come into. So basically once the response comes in, it is actually checking for every context. In here it started off with, uh, so here is where it is actually making the request. Information is sent back to beautiful soup and I'm using beautiful soup to iterate through it. I'm not using XPath, I'm more stronger with a beautiful soup. 
uh, if you see here, I have used one more thing here called regular expressions. So you have to import re.compile and search term is something that I entered there. So it will, it will use regular expression to search into what you have entered there. And the next of the this one is, it is actually searching within the script object if the response has come. If you see, it did not, the response did not come for script, it came only for HTML. Basically saying it's a HTML context attack. So let's try to do this manual hack. It didn't work. But my system says it's vulnerable. Could be. Do you think the cross-site scripting is there or not there? Then why did it not work? Any clues? Because Chrome has an anti-XSS filter. When an external XSS is loaded, it will block it. So one reason why you need to browse using Chrome. It's a much safer browser. I personally use Chrome a lot. But it's your choice. So you can typically like uh, execute the same scenario using Firefox and you will be able to uh, get to see whether the access, sorry, uh, the, this type of attack is there or not. So when you're writing your Selenium script, you launch it with a Chrome, you will think you're safe when you're not. Probably you may want to keep those in mind. So typically, so typically use Firefox browser when you try to you know, do certain things like this uh, and not to use Chrome if, if possible. That's something that I, my personal browsing is on Chrome, but all my security testing is Firefox. One of the reasons is it allows me to do this. And some of the extensions, uh, I don't know if you see this, I, I, I'm loaded an extension here. It's called the hack bar. It allows me to play around with a lot of, unfortunately it's not well clear at all, but it, it, it allows me to play around with uh, URLs much easier. Uh, for a web application hacker, URL is the most important one. So that's the beauty of it. One of the reasons is the plugins, that's the reason. Oh, I'm running out of time. Okay. Command injection. Um, so I'll quickly run through this. I'll not spend too much of a time on this one. Uh, command injection is basically when, let's say there is a, can I have the water? Uh, so you can, let's say there is a ping. You can ping some URLs and it will give you the response to how this information is displayed back. So in this case, if you look at it, there is 127.001 and it is telling that this many, this is the ping response, right? This, this is obvious there. How do you hack this? Ah, sorry, bug there. See, the QA guy doesn't stop. Sorry? Interesting, you're still thinking from a SQL point of view. Because SQL is your stacked queries there. But yeah. on a, think about it, where this output is actually going. This is not going to a SQL database. But I, I like what you thought though, but. But even for that matter, only certain databases allow stacked queries, like SQL Server and MySQL in certain scenarios, PG, uh, Postgres not allowed, Oracle not allowed. It depends on where you are running that. Those help though. So basically, here the output is being sent to an operating system command. The operate, so what I, what is happening here is, it said ping is a, Unix command, right, or a Windows also it uses an executable to run it. So the out, this information that you filled here is going to become an argument to an executable there. If I give you that information, can you still think what hack can you perform? Any, any, any idea? Linux guys should be able to yeah. quickly get this. But why do you want to separate it? Yeah. What if you want to join it together? But Pike, you could use Pike, right? Pike is a Linux one which allows you to join commands together. 
That's what you would do when you see a scenario like this. Can you pipe information and hack and get information out? I hope most of you guys know what pipe is. Pipe is a command in Unix. So. Oh God. Not able to click it, but let me show you the code alone. Just so I'm using the same first DB to do the job here. Oh, sorry. Unfortunately, my local web server is still not running up, up and running. I'm doing the simple thing. I'm using the same first DB here, but uh, the first DB did not have a pipe symbol. So I have to manually, when I write a program, say, put a pipe symbol. Another quick trivia question. If it was Windows environment, how would you do it? Same problem. Ampersand. Ampersands and double ampersands do the same job within Windows environments. These are things that help you to pick up a good security testing stuff. So in this case, will actually help you in order to uh, do this kind of attacks actually. So these, you run it and maybe what you could write a small, you abstract this whole thing separately, give it a URL, it will test every one of them and give you a report back to you. Some of the most co costly solutions for this do the exact same things. Okay, uh, let me, Jeez. unfortunately why is it not clicking? I don't know, it's not, I'm not able to click this. Otherwise I would have loved showing you a demo on this one. Yeah. So, um, two weeks back, I, I don't know if Anamika or all these guys are there in the suburbs. I, so till now we've talked about hacking. We also need to use programming or automating sometimes to even teach, so like for a carpenter, a saw is very important. For a penetration tester, the most important tool is a proxy. A proxy allows me to play around with the HTTP requests and responses that are going and coming. Because that's all that is like a gateway to a server and you basically play around with it, right? So, but these tools that exist talk only some very important protocols like HTTP protocol. It understands only that. Now, there is a new uh, binary protocol which Google has pushed out. They love to use this internally a lot. It's called the protobuf. And one of the applications that I was testing had a protobuf uh, payloads. What if, uh, so now problem is when you send data in a protobuf, the tool does not understand. It does not know how to work with it. Because it supports HTTP, then it works with only HTTP. Exactly. So, and the data is going in a protobuf format. So, we use Python and we use all these automation things to even teach some of these tools. So, I wrote a plugin which I demoed it in a conference in Kerala called Cocoon, which basically said that you could use this to execute any protobuf. So, once it gets it, it will be make it change it into an XML, allow you to do whatever attacks that you want to do, and resell it back, make it into a protobuf stream, and send it out. Uh, only thing I need is I need to start my Windows machine. Just give me a second, please. Uh, so as this is loading, I'll just jump a little bit ahead. Some of the most uh, for you, which I told, this is where I was going to come for cookie jar. Some of the other modules that I use a lot, SUDS. Uh, SUDS allows me to work with web services. Uh, so everything that you do in a normal web application, you could do on a web services hacking also. Yeah. Web services actually has something more. You could basically do some int more attacks like XML in entity injections. So SUDS allows you to automate that process. LXML, another beautiful tool. What if you don't know, 
your output is HTML or JSON or XML or whatever format that is. You use LXML. You make a request and then you tell XML, you tell me what that response is and then you can go ahead and do these jobs. That's a beautiful one. JSON, uh, just a library to work with your JSON. PyAMF, I just put it there because we just came out of a testing of that. AMF is your flex protocol. PyAMF is something you can use for that. My personal favorite is simple HTTP server. This is the best. So, but when you're doing, let's say, a CSRF attack, I need to set up a web server. Do you think I have time to set up a Apache, put it up, bring it up? Apache didn't come up even now, it is, it's just creating issues for me. Put that one line, Python hyphen M, simple HTTP server and port whatever you want. And the web server will up and running in one second. That's a beautiful thing and I love it. Because then I can quickly send this link, use it to do whatever I want. I, one line web server, that's the, the most thing that I use. Just thing to install and work with. You just need to have Python installed. Uh, this is a base library. And uh, Twisted, this is something that we use a lot. Twisted allows us to do a lot of automation. Twisted, you can create web servers, you can do whatever you want to do using this one platform that you have. Okay, if my Windows server has come up, Well, you have, if you have any questions, we can close those questions. Yes. Till the time includes us. You can't do Yeah, I mean, is there any way If he has written a badly made prepared statement, you could do it. But prepared is a genuine statement that it's a good statement. So, but if he's the kind of thing, we can't find the See, as a hacker, you don't know what is there behind. As a, when I'm working, I'm also working black, uh, it's total black box. I only can assume. So, security hacking is, I would say, a very informed guessing sometimes. So you have to try, you have to understand. So sometimes I'm always looking for how the behavior changes. So when I'm doing a SQL injection session, which is a huge one day session itself, you're looking at so many parameters. I'm looking at things like how much is the response change happening? Uh, for a true condition, what is the response? What is the negative condition? What is the response? And there are so many parameters that you really look at. So, uh, if you use the prior statements, you should assume it's secure. But no guarantees. You could really make a bad job even there. It's, it's one of those preventive mechanisms. It's a good preventive mechanism. It's a, it, there is no other alternatives. Just don't make a bad comparison. That's it. <coughs> Have you tried to bypass captures? Um, now, when you say bypass, what are you saying? Uh, are you talking about technologies like recapture or use application itself to go read, get data, and pull it in? Uh, no, I, I just uh, put it some young values in uh, capture and data. So, what I can talk about is, uh, there is a Python library called Teaser. Yes. So this basically allows you to do optical character recognition. But nothing, if you use a recapture which Google gives, your none of these libraries will be able to pick it up. So, if you're really thinking, can I take that value, put it in there, you might try. Uh, if you have a very bad uh, character, let's say, some line, one, two lines and just set up numbers, Python libraries can pick it up easily. You can use them to automate this. How do you do it? Then you say, uh, use beautiful soup, find out which element will come in there, take that image, make a request, uh, use your Python to get that image and make a value, and submit your request. That's how I would do it. But there are many libraries, Recap that definitely is not Yes. I use both. I use both. 
LXML is definitely faster. I use LXML first time to make a choice, at least to tell me what it is and all that. Definitely, it's a personal choice. I, I, I would definitely I alternate with you. But you can still manipulate it and to get data out of the system. Let's say, so with a SQL injection, a badly programmed system, you can take full control of the whole database. That way, you can actually control the machine on the client uh, server side there. Something with the MongoDB is not definitely going to happen. Um, so for this, I would definitely suggest you a tool called SQL Map. SQL Map is a beautiful tool uh, for SQL injections. It's one of the best tools available, totally written in Python, and that's the best. Uh, I forget the name, but I think there is a derivative for it for using even for uh, your non-relational non uh, database systems also. There's, so there's no single silver bullet that is there. So you want to fix? There's no single. I think I think I would advise you to read uh, a web hackers web hackers application security book. It's a it's web like application a Bible. hackers handbook. Yeah. So it's like a bible, but I think you will get to like you'll get to know certain information as in like how can you derive which, which database this particular application is using, and based on that you can actually continue with your security like hacking stuff. So. Web Application Security Handbook. Web Application Hackers Handbook. Two minutes. Yes, that was built on PyQt. So what this basically, I wanted to quickly show you a demo is two minutes. Um, there's a string here. I'm just going to hit this. If you see there is a request that was made, look at the raw body. This basically sends data in protobuf format. Well, I'm not going to go into the protobuf. You can look at my Kukon exploits, how we built it. This allows this, me. This, I think it's not variable. Oh, so if you click this, it actually breaks your whole uh, binary. So in this kind of format, data goes in zeros and ones. It does not go as your typical HTTP request. It goes in all zeros and ones. It's basically hex data. This allows me to break the data. Uh, so I'll just show you how we did it. Uh, download this tool and you can get this plugin already. I'll send you the links. Uh, I'll put it in my references. So this basically allows me, this is a binary manipulation. So till now what I was talking about all was HTTP. Protobuf decoder, what we did was we took data and we played with binary data. And we could break things and uh, so what I did was from protobuf I made it into an XML wherein I did all my modifications and then send it back. Uh, someone is interested or not protobuf works I can you can find me and we can talk. 
Like maybe I can show it to you better screen than this it is. Thank you so much, guys.